all of Washington, D.C. is obsessed with war. All of the mansions around Washington, D.C. are built on the backs of war contracts and the war contractors. All of the wealth that flows through Washington, D.C. Uh, is because of war and big pharma. And so if you are an anti-war presidential candidate, you stand no chance of being elected. Uh, and the deep state will not let you win. They control the purse strings. They control the donors. They control the intelligence apparatus. If you are pro-peace, you are you will not become president. I mean, that's the thing. If you're a pro-peace candidate in 2023, 2024, you will not become president. They will not let you become president. I don't like you just saying that because I'm holding out hope for the next election. You can have all the hope you want, but we'll follow the money. I mean, let us know in the chat if you believe if you're a pro-peace candidate, you stand a chance of winning. Like, just I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. That's you're being why very pessimistic about it. Uh, but I've been around and I know a thing or two. And so I'm just, you know, I'm pessimistic based on past history of these clowns. So that's why virtually every Republican presidential candidate supports sending more weapons and money to Ukraine. Uh, or if not directly to Ukraine, then, you know, to the South China Sea in order to provoke a war with China. We'll send it to the Philippines, maybe not necessarily Ukraine. It's the same thing, just a different enemy. It doesn't really matter. It's just another boogeyman that they can send money to. Now that Ukraine has lost this war, it might make sense to, to start talking about peace. Now, you know, what, like what's left over over the past 24 hours, Putin and Russia have launched a devastating series of attacks against Odessa and targets there. Of course, this was the exact area where the Crimean bridge attack was launched from. So they're taking out pieces of Odessa, which that's game over if they take Odessa. For Ukraine. So now would be a good time to start talking about peace. But instead, the Biden administration is doubling down this morning on more war. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin says we need to build a future force for Ukraine for long term security. So now we're not just nation building. We're now going to build a long term military for Ukraine. Like, what does that mean exactly? In other words, send more money, weapons, and troops to Ukraine. Here's the secretary trying to explain this. Uh, first, on the agreement with Ukraine, we can expect, and you saw evidence of this uh, with the G7 announcement at the end of the Vilnius summit, we can expect that countries uh, will um, execute bilateral agreements with, uh, with Ukraine going forward. And certainly we will as well. And, and that's a work in progress. Uh, but I would tell you, uh, our part of that, the chairman and I are focused on uh, not only making sure that Ukraine has what it needs to be successful today, uh, but we also have to make sure that they have a capability to defend themselves in the future and to deter aggression in the future. So uh, while we're uh, doing what's necessary to make sure that they can be successful today, uh, we're also going to have to uh, work with allies and partners uh, to, uh, to do to, to build a, a future force, and uh, and so that's the a hard work that's got to got to happen. And right now we're kind of at that at that point where uh, we're doing both uh, uh, simultaneously. Uh, so you see that in some cases we've invested in some things uh, that because they have to be produced they won't they won't uh, materialize until. Um, couple of uh, months down the road, or in some cases a year down the road. But those kinds of things help uh, provide the capability that Ukraine is going to need in the future. Oh, okay. Uh, Ukraine has so. everything they need to succeed, which is an invitation well, to peace talks. Yeah, yeah, th that's your ticket. That's your winning ticket, the golden ticket. That is that they do have what they need to succeed right now already. It would cost nobody another cent, except maybe just a plane ticket to Turkey or China or Saudi Arabia or whoever is willing to host it. Uh, yeah, well, that exists not already. All, on top of all the money we've already sent them, we're paying their pensions and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we're we're paying for health care for the for the um, Zelensky's people. Like we're we're helping them with their economy while ours suffers. Yeah. Oh well, don't worry. We're giving our military sex changes on taxpayer dollars, and we're going to talk oh, about that next. Yeah. So we're taking yeah, care of ours too. Well, I don't know about that because Ben yeah, Shapiro, priorities. you know, Ben Shapiro says that it, one thing doesn't have to do with the other. Like our economy in the United States is crumbling. Poverty is rampant in the United States. Giving money to Ukraine has nothing to do with the poverty in the United States. So that's what Ben Shapiro said um, today. Uh, which I found in, I found an interesting, that was a very interesting way to put it. Um, I don't agree with it at all, 
but I found that that was interesting. Uh, the de- <laughs> that's the Democratic side, uh, which used to claim. So that was the Democrats there. We saw Lloyd Austin there, which used to claim to be the party of peace, uh, anti-war. Not anymore. They are pro-war and Republicans are right there with them. The neoconservatives that run the party are also running for president and they very much do not want this war to end. The only difference between Democrats and Republicans on Ukraine is how quickly weapons are being sent there. That's the only difference. Republicans believe that Biden has been slow. This is the argument you're hearing, right? That Biden has been slow and that we should be sending them more and way faster. And Biden says we're sending them fast enough. That's it. There's almost zero daylight between Democrats and Republicans on this issue. Tucker Carlson just dismantled the Republican Party on one neocon after the next. We're going to show you a few of those clips in just a moment. But first, if you're looking for a pro-peace candidate right now, you'll be hard pressed to find one. The only one that the GOP side on the GOP side that is actually calling for peace is about to face another round of criminal indictments for the January 6th protest. Donald Trump says he will be um, arrested and uh, and indicted for that. Uh, Say what you want about him. You can say whatever you want about him. He's the only one that's been calling for immediate peace. And naturally, they're doing anything they can, of course, to make sure and stop him from becoming president again. The deep state in the United States will not, under any circumstances, allow a pro-peace candidate becoming president. They just won't. Um, Or... Or staying president for very long if you are pro-peace and you want to end a war, just ask JFK. Well, if you look at the trajectory of this war, went really well under Obama, and then really it plateaued under Trump. They weren't able to make much ground, so they needed him out so that they could ramp it back up under Biden. Yeah, because he was, you know, friendly with Putin. He's like, we're not going to go to war with, why are we going to war with Russia? So the neocons that were dragging us towards uh, a war with Putin over Ukraine did so well during the Obama administration that they continued to escalate and escalate. And then they were thwarted yeah. under the Trump administration. So uh, no matter what you think of President Trump, yeah, the, he was not willing to escalate um, with Russia over Ukraine. So here is Trump last night on Hannity revealing the dirty lies that the media in Washington, D.C. are telling about this war. Listen. So they finished with the rockets. You have cities with no buildings standing. It looks like just a demolition zone. It's so horrible. Sad. And you know, and then they'll say two people were hurt. No, hundreds of people and thousands of people were killed. You're going to find out when this whole thing is over that the number of people killed is far greater than they tell you. They're not telling you the truth. Many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are dying. These cities are being obliterated. And basically they say, what's your stance? Are you for Russia or are you for... I'm for one thing very simple. I want to stop people from getting killed and I'll have it stop. Take a break. We'll come back. Yeah. And well, I should. And and that's true. And also Vivek Ramaswamy is also um, pushing for this. But again, this is how these guys, you cannot have a pro peace president. Yes. But I think he seems to want a war with China. Vivek Ramaswamy. Yes. So I'm not going to, I'm not well, going to put him all the way in into, to, yeah, into the like, peace category. I'm not really into the Ukraine thing, but let's go to you know, war with China. That sounds like a good idea. So again, it's like moving these pieces around on a chessboard. It's like, okay, well, no, I'm very much anti the Ukraine war, but, but China. So you have to be very, very careful here because it's just a redistribution of this war money into a different enemy. Um, and that's what it's all about. Here, Tucker pushes Nikki Haley on why the GOP is mysteriously quiet on Biden's bombing of the Nord Stream pipeline. Watch. Well, speaking of of energy in the military, who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline? I mean, I I don't know. Do I'm not I'm not claiming you did it. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Do you know who did it? Uh, seems pretty obvious it was backed by the Biden administration, I would say. I mean, I think all the evidence suggests that, but I wasn't there. I guess uh, what I'm really saying is if you were running against the Biden administration to do something like that and shaft our closest allies in the world, which would be Western Europe, and deprive them of the energy they need to run their manufacturing sector and destroy their economy, which it is in the process of doing, like, that's a major sin to have done something like that. You just well, betrayed our allies, and no one on the right is accusing the Bidens of what they clearly did. So I don't know why. 
So <laughs> she looks exasperated to be asked about this. Can't even answer it. Like you, you would think that you would be incredibly critical, right? If you were running against it, you would absolutely be out there saying the Biden administration blew up the Nord Stream, but you, there's not a peep about it. There's no discussion yeah, the, about it. No, but the, sorry, that, Philip. Is that Sun Tzu that's like never interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake? Yeah. You know, it's like like you, you'd think they would they would be like, hey, you know, like like look at this. Like he just clearly handed them like this huge talking point, And they're just like, nope, nope, nope we're not going to even touch it. We're not going to even touch it. You just bombed the Nord Stream pipeline. You just, you know, really destroyed the economies of your closest allies in Europe. No discussion about it. No one's mentioning it. No, but she's giving long orations that are anti-China. Yeah. Uh, you know, that is her. She's totally willing to go full in on anti-China and say how she's been warning about how they're bad news all along. Well, but so yes. this is an obvious one. This is a gimme because this is a war that's happening, not the one you're stoking. So, so many of these other candidates are also anti-China and they're they're anti they're anti-Russia. Here's Asa Hutchinson uh, on why it's more important to send troops to the Philippines than to protect our own borders. Listen to this. So we have U.S. military personnel in over 100 bases around the world. The president, as you saw yesterday, mobilized some reserves. Um, to support the effort against Russia in Eastern Europe. Why wouldn't you use uniformed, I, and maybe, I mean, you, you ran the agency, so you may know the answer, and I'm, I'm ignorant, but, but why wouldn't you just create a human wall of American military personnel and just kind of fix the problem immediately? We could afford to do that. We don't want to do that for some reason. What am I missing? Well, a couple points there. Uh, first of all, uh, the military is always an option that might be needed at some point. But I want to be able to fix it without having to How about when the military. 7 million people come in? Is that the point? I would like to be able to do it without using the military for a couple of reasons. First of all, we want to show strength with China and making sure we have a military presence in the Philippines. Uh, we want to make sure that we show strength in Europe and that we're able to maintain a military that has a global presence. Okay, so making sure we have troops in the Philippines and show China our resolve. But our southern border, that's totally fine. Just leave it wide open. Just leave it wide open. No concern at all for that. We do have a new military base in the Philippines. Yeah. Oh, two. We have two new ones yeah. in the yeah in the Philippines. That's so, a check mark. Yeah, we we've already got that. that. But we need to send more, make sure we've got more people there. So Asa Hutchinson, you know, again, falling right in line with the rest of the GOP. And then, ju and then just another, perhaps the most explosive in all of this, Mike Pence, so former Vice President Mike Pence falls back on the Republican talking point, which says that President Biden hasn't sent weapons to Ukraine fast enough. It's like that's that's what we're arguing here. You know, he hasn't sent F-16s there. He hasn't sent F-35s there. He, why is Biden dragging his feet on this? Like this is the debate that we're having. If he were president, he would do it much more efficiently. And then this happened. Watch. I'm sorry, Mr. Vice President. Have you I know you're running for president. You are Thank distra you, you are distressed noticing. that the Ukrainians don't have enough American tanks. Every city in the United States has become much worse over the past three years. Yeah. Drive around. There's not one city that's gotten better in the United States. Thanks. And it's visible. Our economy has degraded. The suicide rate has jumped. Public filth and disorder and crime have exponentially increased. And yet... Your concern is that the Ukrainians, a country most people can't find on a map, who've received tens of billions of U.S. tax dollars, don't have enough tanks. Right. I think it's a fair question to ask, like, where's the concern for the United States in that? Well, it's not my concern. <laughs> Tucker, I've heard that routine from you before, but that's not my concern. So, so that's not my concern. So you could look at that a couple of different ways, right? Tucker, that's not my concern because I'm above that and I can walk and chew gum at the same time. Like what, that's what one, hold on. Mean? That's one way to look at it, right? Another way to look at it is I don't give a rat's ass about the American cities because I'm more concerned about what's happening in Ukraine. So as some are saying, no, no, he clearly doubled down on it and said, that's not my concern. American cities are not my concern. This is not my concern. Well, I think maybe. The way that I'm reading it is he thinks he can walk and chew gum at the same time. I can send as many tanks and, and, and jets to Ukraine efficiently as I possibly can. And I can totally take care of America. Like, that's what I think he was trying to walk back later and say. 
Yeah, the first time I watched this, I thought he was saying Ukraine is not my concern. But no, he absolutely is. Because no, he doubled down on it and Tucker right. gave him another chance to say it. So uh, it's not my concern. I mean, you could say it reminded me a little bit of that German politician when asked about like, OK, Germany's collapsing. Do you not care about your German constituents? And she said, I know I care more about Ukraine. I, I don't, you know, German voters are, they're, they're fine. I don't care about them. I care more about Ukraine. Um, and that's what this reminded me of. This reminded me of this moment where, no, I don't care that a Philadelphia is literally swimming in filth and there's murders multiple times a day in big cities all across the United States. I care more about making sure that we get jets into Ukraine. Yeah, well, it's such I, a charade. It's, I mean, it's a polished turd. Mm -hmm. I, I really hope that, he gets to keep doing this because I love the fact that because you notice what Pence did after he asked him the question, he goes to his stump speech. I'm going to take America and I'm going to make it right. this and this and this. And Tucker doesn't let him keep going. And that's what happens in every debate we've ever watched. All this stuff, they just go right in their stump speech and they never challenge him. I love that. He's like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. You know, and he challenges him. So I hope that this is setting the, the bar for the debates that we'll see throughout the election cycle. Right. Yeah, I wonder if Tucker will do debates if they'll, you know, because let him host one. Yeah, for I mean, because the mainstream oh media, who's going to let him do so it? Awesome. You know, I mean, yeah, if he does it for one. his own, he's launching his own new media company. I love unless to see there was a Twitter debate, uh, which I don't yeah. think any Democratic candidate would participate in because they're too busy, you know, crapping on Twitter. So then he asked Mike Pence as a Christian, uh, why are we supporting a country and a leader in Ukraine like Zelensky, which is arrested priests, nuns? Um, persecuting Christians in Ukraine. Um, why are we supporting that? And uh, here, and it, but it just, it didn't go well. Watch this. You recently met with Zelensky, according to news reports. And I'm wondering if during that meeting, as a prominent Christian leader, which you are in addition to your political views, you broached the question of his treatment of Christians within Ukraine. The Zelensky government has raided convents, arrested priests, has effectively banned a denomination, a Christian denomination, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church within Ukraine, has persecuted Christians. And I wonder if you raised that with him. I, I did raise the issue when we were there. And I, I raised it with uh, the leader of the Orthodox Church when I was visiting Kiev and asked him about concerns about religious liberty. He assured me that the Zelensky government in Ukraine was respecting religious liberty. Even he believed that uh, the Zelensky government was respecting religious liberty. And I must tell you, I, other than the sanctity of life, there's no higher priority in my life than preserving the freedom of religion in America and championing religious liberty around the world. I'm confused. On this question, it's very clear that the Zelensky government has arrested priests for having views they disagree with. That's not consistent with religious liberty. It's an attack on it, and we're funding it. And I'm just wondering how is it, and I don't mean to be disrespectful at all, but I sincerely wonder how a Christian leader could support the arrests of Christians for having different views. Well, what, what, what I can tell you is I asked, the Christian leader in Kiev, if that was in fact happening, and he assured me that it was not. And I believe that it is in the interest of the United <laughs> States of America to continue to give the Ukrainian military the resources that they need to repel the Russian invasion and restore their sovereignty. Would you, may, may I ask, would, would you be, and I, I believe you have a good faith position on this, and we have disagreements on it, but I want to just, I, I can't let you elide over the question of the treatment of Christians. And I, I know, I, I heard and that would again, you be, well, No, but hold on. Would you, you, would you be willing? The problem is you don't accept my answer. I just told you that I asked the religious leader in Kiev if it was happening. You asked me if I raised the issue, and I did. And I'm saying I also raised it incorrect. with the Ukrainians, and I was told that there are, there are religious leaders who have been working with the Russian military that is murdering people by the thousands. Okay. I mean, tr Tucker, look. Uh, Wait, but hold on. Don't you think... Let me explain to you what I think our national interest is there. I would think you would have greater concern for religious liberty in Ukraine. And I'm surprised I, I by your I told you I raised the issue of religious liberty. No, you spoke to one person who's clearly I didn't on say one I side of it. Person. And I, there are many, many news reports that are not disputed by anybody that right. many clergy have been arrested in Ukraine. And I'm merely saying I may not agree with their views. I'm not Russian Orthodox. But you can't arrest clergy for having different views, period. Because if you do, you violate the basic tenet of look, religious I, liberty. Look, I won't look. I want to be clear with you. I won't stand by it. I won't stand for it. Oh, okay.
That's an I, anecdote. I, but I talked to one person. I talked to one guy who's like a high, you know, a, a high level, you know, Zelensky religious, you know. One anecdote is not data. I talked to Zelensky who promised you know, me I, they're not doing this. And that's it. You talked to one guy. I, I just remember, I just remember. Yeah. I just remember, like in, in college, you know, you'd get that you get that class where like the professor would be like, you know, they like lay out some statistic. They'd be like, you know, like eighty seven percent of people do this, and somebody chime in, and be like, that's not true because my cousin did right. this and it happened the other way. Yes. And it's right. like, oh yeah, okay, get, my bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, so like, your like, cousin, one guy. Yeah, exactly. I remember I went to see Jerry Seinfeld do stand up one time in in Philadelphia, and uh, he was he was making fun of the post office. You know, and he was like doing jokes about how painfully slow it is to go to the post office. And somebody yelled out, you're not funny. He goes, oh, are you a are you a postal employee? And the guy said, yes. <laughs> and everyone just lost it. He's like, oh, so I'm sorry, sir. We found the one and not at your post office. Your post office is the only efficient post office. I'm sorry, sir. It was just a hilarious back and forth. But the anecdote, like this guy got pissed that his one post office mm -hmm. was the anecdote of it. Yeah. Do, do you think I I, I want to know this? Like, do you think Pence, when he decided he was going to run for president, actually thought he had a chance? Do you think he sat there and thought, "I think I really have a chance to be president. Yeah. I'm going for this." Yeah. I do because it? I think that he has. He thinks that he can maybe run on the appetite for January six as like I'm one of them who stood up against January six. He thinks he's a hero of it, and also he's very comfortable. For instance, when pushed on his fundamental religious beliefs, he was pushed a lot on sort of the more salacious details of Donald Trump's life, and he's very used to like he did in this video. He sort of raises his chin and looks away, like. I'm above that question, and I I will say words that make it go away. Yeah, and that's well, if you read how Bob, it works. If you read Bob Woodward's reporting on on Trump, and you he, realize like you, you really realize how what Pence was. He Pence was there just to ride the coattails, just to, to you know to make his way into the White House in this way, plucked from obscurity in Indiana to be taken in there. Um, he really looked at you know was looking at this as a total opportunity, and uh, and I think that's exactly it. He can play the I'm the I'm the good Christian Republican. Don't vote for Trump. You know, he's the troublemaker. So I'm going to run against him now. And that's 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 the strategy. Like you, this is the Trump administration, but without the like controversy. Yeah. So you'll get that's what you'll get. Yeah. I, I'm sure he really is suffering from uh, extreme disillusions. I want to play one more because I think this is, you know, the Pence one was bad. Uh, but perhaps worst of all, actually, was Tim Scott. And, and I say that because it's the clearest example that the GOP has no idea what a victory would look like in Ukraine. And what's the end game for us there uh, to send hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine and have hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians killed at the hands of NATO? He starts off by asking him if he supports sending cluster bombs to Ukraine, and he can't give any kind of a straight answer at all about that. Uh, Tim Scott says that he wants peace. So Tucker says, well, why not force a peace agreement like we already had in place before? And then it was scuttled because the United States got in its way. Why don't we force a peace? We have the power to do that. We can absolutely do that. We can put fake governments in place, puppet governments. We can actually force a peace if we want it. And Tim Scott said, well, how do you do that? I have no idea. Watch this. You know, the third absolutely. world war very quickly. So why not force a peace? How would you we do that? Do, well, you could tell Ukraine, and they are a client state of the United States without American backing, there's kind of no Ukraine. We're literally paying the salaries of their bureaucrats. Um, we want you to sit down, as they tried to do, but were stopped by our government, um, and stop this war. Yeah. And, and reach a peace as, as one does, where both sides, you know, concede some of their interests. Like, why wouldn't that be in our interest to do that? I think the faster we get to peace, the better off we are. What we don't want to do, from my perspective, is allow ourselves to ask for a premature peace that cannot be achieved as the alliances continue to come together. Uh, to the extent that we can find our path out of this situation, the better off we are. What? So what's the point at which we'll know that we've achieved our goal? Just, and, and I say that within the context of having watched 20 years of occupation in Afghanistan where nobody could answer the question, what's the point? Yes. And no one in Congress ever asked that question, amazingly. So what is the, what is the specific goal here? Yeah, so I would say that 
the objective should be for Zelensky and Ukraine to be able to achieve victory by maintaining as much of their territory as they possibly can and then seeing the resources that we've deployed along with our Western alliances achieving the peace that I believe comes when you get these two folks to sit down and have a conversation that allows them to determine where those lines will be drawn for the next hundred years. Yeah, that's called a word salad. That's how you talk if you only read CNN. Or, yeah, or watch CNN. Right. Yeah, maybe read CNN. Yeah, we're going to bring together our, our allies in the world and that's how, and then Zelensky at the table and taking back and making sure they can have their land and our alliance is together. And then we advance in that alliance and then we have land and Zelensky and alliance. And what the hell are you talking about? What does that even mean? What? I have no idea what you're talking about. It was a total word salad. I can't and tell you. You're running for president of the United States. One of the most important questions of our time right now is, will we go to World War III with Russia? Will we actually put boots on the ground? President Biden's doing that. 3,000 reservists being called up to deploy to Europe, sending more weapons and more quickly and developing a future force for Ukraine. I mean, what, you know, what could be more important? Sorry, that's, I bumped a voice effect. <laughs> that's the thing that, that really bothers me about these people is they get, the, they can say this word salad because nobody ever challenges them on it. So there's, they're like, they'll say their word salad and then their team comes out the next day. Well, what he really meant was after they have time to put it through their PR spin and what yeah. he was really trying to say, but like, that's the thing, like not letting them just say those word salad things and putting pressure on them. We see who they really are. And these people don't know what the hell they're talking about. And they'll be clamped down further. You're right about that. Because as we tighten the field, there'll be less of these events, you know, and they'll be just much more handled and focused. And you won't get to have these questions. You won't get to have the sort of free form, you know, conservative political action committee discussions, free form flowing conversations. It'll be much more controlled environment. And yeah, we won't get these moments. You'll have the much more robotic Mike Pence, you know, dodging questions, not answering the questions. And it'll be more of this crap. But this is your GOP field right now. This is this is what you've got. They've got one guy who, you know, whatever you think of him, he's going to be handed a new pile of indictments and he's pro peace uh, in Ukraine specifically. Um, And uh, and, you know, he was defending Xi Jinping, saying, like, he doesn't hate America. He just he loves China. That's what Trump was saying. He's like, he doesn't want to bomb America. He just want he he, he loves China. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, we're going to see. But. Uh, they're not going to allow a, a pro peace candidate to get very far. It just really feels like these guys either they really want war or they just don't study. Like they mm. just literally don't do your it's, homework. Right. So it's the default setting. Or both. It's like the easier thing to do. Or both. Yeah. Yeah. And like well, I... the, the the bit about like studying in order to, you know, present your message as war propaganda, at least that takes some kind of homework. But this sort of laziness of like the politician we we saw a couple of weeks ago that didn't even know where the Donbass was. Like you cannot say shit about the war if you don't know where Donbass is and don't know that it's been raging there since 2014. Then shut up, say nothing about the war, and go back and do your reading and go back and do your homework. He said, yeah, and that politician was like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll look like, that up. I don't I'll know. look that up. I don't know anything about Donetsk. I don't know anything about the Donbass. Uh, I don't know anything about genocide. But um, uh, you know, I'm very pro peace no but Pru- yeah. but putin's a madman so we need to keep going so this right. idea like well, watching yeah. these people say these war rhetoric things feeling like they don't do their homework that is like the one thing i cannot abide you don't know what you're saying you're just saying political speak yeah yeah go ahead Dan. well and i want to say like the the one president that challenged that that actually got in that realized peace and tried to push for peace was in the 60s and we know what happened to him yeah so they yeah. do not want peace in this country right yeah i know exactly um you know and that's why rfk jr um you know it's a very interesting candidate right now um and would close military bases around the world do you think that they're going to let robert f kennedy jr become president i mean come on no do you think that that's going to happen and when i say that what i mean is the deep state the the people that control the donors the, the people that control the media all of it and I'm not saying that something nefarious is going to happen. I mean, who knows, right? But what I'm saying is that the people that 
pushed Trump out yeah. um, are the very same people that do that do not want a pro peace candidate. Absolutely not, because it's it's it will lose them trillions of dollars. And that's all you need to do is follow the money. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.